Hi, welcome to the Becoming Human Project and my channel on YouTube. Um, my name is Samuel Lankar, if you haven't watched my videos before. And I want to tell you in this video um, about how philosophy saved my life. I want to wish you a very happy new year and I wanted to start this new year by telling you a bit about my story and how philosophy has helped me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. So for those of you who are new to the channel, this is a great introduction. And to those of you who um, haven't been here before, welcome. Um, let me just tell you a bit about my story. I was dying um, from a very severe autoimmune disease um, that I still have in one sense. Um, it's technically a disease science says is incurable. I don't actually believe that. Um, it's been getting cured. But the pathway to my healing, which has been a really difficult process and is sort of still ongoing, is the pathway that I want to share with you. Because in April, um, about five years ago, four years ago, I was lying in bed and I couldn't move. I hadn't been able to move um, without extraordinary pain for months. And so I basically would spend my days um, being in bed and when I had to be um, sitting in a chair and I required help. And I was very blessed to have two people in my life at that time who were helping taking care of me and who loved me. Um, at the same time, I was finishing a PhD at Yale, and I didn't really have any resources through Yale to deal with my illness, and there was no kind of institutional support for that, which I don't blame Yale, but I basically tried to hide my illness from the university as much as possible, both because it caused physical um, symptoms that were totally non-contagious, but that made me very insecure and that people had already made fun of me for. Um, at different points. And, uh, you know, if you think a person is sick or something, people will treat you like you're, you know, like you're dangerous or something. And that, of course, makes the sickness even worse. So I was lying in bed and I'll be honest, I was kind of, um, you know, felt very, very uh, dark. But I had a lot of um, hope and faith, which is how I got through all of this illness, particularly in the times when I was sort of laid up for a total of about two years, for example, in one of the extreme points of my illness, I was basically couldn't move uh, for about six months, four to six months of those two years each year. And I was still doing stuff. So I would do things, but it would cost me an enormous amount of, of pain. And I didn't read books. Um, I had read books my entire uh, adult life. I'd been reading and studying in college. I loved reading, I loved philosophy, I loved the study of religion, and I loved teaching. Um, it's sort of something that just gives me joy in life. And I, I wasn't doing any of that except what I had to do at Yale, which I tried to do very well, and I did in general. I don't think most people even knew I was really that sick, but I was really sick. And um, and there was no recourse. Uh, the, the disease that I have is something that there's no scientific understanding of in a technical way, and there's no cure in terms of medicine. So um, I I got to a point where I, I faced the fact that I didn't have any clear path forward as a human being uh, in the way that we normally think of our lives. I was young, you know, 30 basically, and I had hoped to have uh, an academic career like anyone who's doing a PhD. I knew how difficult that career was and I wasn't confident I would have one, but I knew I was a good scholar and a good teacher and I knew I had a good project and all of these things. But the truth is I was in denial. I was like, I was in denial, a denial that I'm, I don't blame myself for. Um, and a denial that in a way helped get me to the point I'm about to explain, but that denial was a denial of how severely sick I was and how there was nothing in the world outside of myself other than the love of the people in my life that was sustaining me. So I got access to the uh, a special program in Connecticut for medical marijuana. And that program um, helped begin a process of healing me. And I was from a very conservative background, which I was no longer conservative in the same way, but I've been raised to be very suspicious of just all drugs. I didn't make any distinctions. I didn't know anything. And as I was educated by my doctor about the med medical benefits of marijuana, 
um, I I decided to try this because nothing, of course, really works in general for the disease I have, and nothing's reliable. And for the first time, I had some pain relief, which allowed me to sleep. I hadn't been able to sleep basically most of my adult life. I had insomnia. And I also um, hadn't been able to sleep particularly because of the extraordinary amount of pain um, to do with my illness. So, and then that, of course, makes your illness worse because when you don't sleep, it, you know, hurts your autoimmune system. So it's a terrible cycle, as some of you may know. You're sick, your sickness causes you pain, your pain causes you lack of sleep, your lack of sleep causes you more pain, more sickness, you despair of healing. So I wondered what the role of anything that I had thought was important in my life was. And I had a kind of faith um, that I would be able to survive uh, this. But I didn't realize what that faith would cost me. My study of philosophy had led me to have a very deep respect for the beliefs I had been raised with, beliefs about Christianity, but it had led me to um, a more, you could say, Jewish understanding of that material and a more philosophical understanding of the material, a faith, you could say, in an ultimate power and creator and a particular faith in debt in my own life to the history of philosophy and particularly the history of philosophy in Judaism and Christianity and the role of Jesus as a philosopher who had been really essential to helping me understand the developments in my culture and even in a way in my own life. But there I was on his bed and none of that uh, from any obvious sense seemed to help me. So what changed was hope. I began through the sheer belief that anything could help me at all. I began to realize there is a path from the place I am to a place of hope. And even in the situation I was in, I realized in spite of all my pain, I was still able to be useful to people. I was able to teach and people enjoyed my teaching. And I was able to do scholarly work to some extent um, and people seemed to benefit from that. And so when I was finally wiped out of even those abilities, except for the minimal teaching, I thought, well, I have nothing to offer, right? What's the point? What's the point? And I returned to just the essence of what I had been taught in my life, which was not from books. It was not from ideas. It was from this root idea that I had seen in Socrates and in Jesus um, the figures who had most influenced me, which was that philosophy is about your life. Philosophy is about caring enough for your own life that you'll be willing to do anything to figure out how to live and how to live well. And so I realized I've got to do this for myself. I have to find a way to fight through my own hope as my only anchor towards a place in which my own love of ideas and my love of wisdom became totally existentially personal. I realized I have to find a way to love myself and my own life in a way that makes me willing to do everything, including if it means renouncing my career aspirations, right? Which I hadn't been willing to do. I thought somehow I could have all of these ideas that are already kind of controversial because I have a very systematic, you know, a take on things and that's not what the academy often wants. And I also just didn't want to confront that I didn't fit into academia very well. I'm ethnically mixed background, but I had never sort of used any of my background identity in academia to sort of um, understand myself. And so it, it had played in a sense only a negative role for me. Um, and I was very unconscious of that. I didn't realize how much I didn't fit in with the white wasp culture of Yale, but it, you know, I just couldn't see that. I didn't want to see that I appeared very other um, and very different to people. And that was honestly part of what made me really sick is that I couldn't, I couldn't see myself. I couldn't see that even in ways that were beautiful, I was being hurt by things that I couldn't understand about myself. And so I, I date that moment in April, um, about four years ago as this moment of hope where I began to realize that if I have hope and if I'm able to anchor that hope in this love that I've had for everything but myself, um, a love for the people around me that was very imperfect, but it was very genuine. But I never, 
I never gave myself anything like the love or attention, particularly to my own body and its need to heal, that I had given ideas. And I realized I had made ideas a kind of idol. I had made books a kind of idol. And I hadn't even considered the possibilities of what could heal me. If it weren't for my wife at the time who had found out about this program, I would have never even got access to the medicine that began to help heal my condition at a, at a deep physical level and give me a sense of hope. Um, and it, But it compromised my identity in the sense that I, I was very open at that point. I've since become very grateful. And I encourage anyone, if you don't know about the medical benefits of properly medically supervised marijuana in a way that's appropriate in your context, you, you should absolutely look into it. And if you have any kind of bias against it, as people like from my background, like I did, I would just say, please educate yourself. There's so many documentaries. It has saved people's life. It, it helped save my life. And the fact that we've stigmatized it and hurt so many people, particularly in the black community, with the legislation about it is something I'm very personally concerned about and passionate about. But the, the physical possibility of hope then connected to, and it wasn't separate from my sense spiritually of what philosophy was really about, which is like, I've loved wisdom as if it was some abstract thing. I've loved wisdom as if I could find what I need in books. And you can find a lot of things in books. I love books and I teach books, but I realize I have to find wisdom in my actual life, in my actual human, miserably suffering, afflicted body. And so I began that process. The medicine was a beginning that began to help me cope with pain and to sleep. But then I began a kind of systematic, and I will say very rocky and imperfect, very much in process, okay? But I began a systematic attempt with the help of my partner to learn what I needed to do to heal and to devote my energy towards healing and to renounce everything that was keeping me sick. I renounced my academic aspirations. I didn't apply for the conventional academic jobs. Um, I was really sick when I graduated from Yale anyway. Again, very few people knew this, except occasionally when I had to miss class for it. Um, but no one knew the extent of my illness because I didn't want them to. I didn't want sympathy. Um, in a certain sense that, that I knew in a way wouldn't be forthcoming anyway. I also didn't want the shame because academics and like everyone, they'll, you know, people are made uncomfortable by illness and they're made uncomfortable by it so that they'll pretend they care. But in reality, it's just a stigma. And so I had a very stigmatizing disease already because of the way it could affect my physical appearance. And I didn't want the stigma of people thinking of my as like, oh, he's sick. Um, and I didn't think of myself that way. I, I was like, I have a disease, but I'm coping with it. And I think it's important to have perspective. But at some point, you have to recognize I have something the matter with me. And I'm not saying it's your fault. But I, what I had to realize was I had something the matter with me that only I could face. And no one could face it for me. And at that point, and there have been other points in the past, but at that point, philosophy became extremely personal to me that there was a power in wisdom and a power in love and a power in the things I had understood, in particular Plato, um, that had actually already been helping me heal in certain ways, morally and mentally, helping just reconcile contradictions that were very deep in my mind. And those contradictions, I think, really did manifest in my body, that I was so divided between what is philosophy? What is religion? What are the gods? How do I honor my ancestors? I come partly from a Native American and an Okinawan background, and I, I care deeply about honoring my ancestors. And I care deeply about also knowing part of my background is white. And it kind of tore me apart. And, and, and I couldn't even see that. And I couldn't see how much I didn't fit into academia. And I couldn't see how much I was already on sort of the wrong side of academia. Um, not because I wasn't a good scholar or professional stuff and that I, I still love serving academia, and I, but I have my own vision of the system. I don't believe academia should be as exclusive as it is. I don't believe academia should be as classist as it is. I don't believe academia should be as, we shouldn't tolerate the degree of systematic just racism and economic exclusion that's part of academia. And, and we shouldn't tolerate the idea that you have to have a lot of money to be um, someone who can study. I don't believe that. 
And so part of the path to healing was to finding hope and it was to find love um, in myself and from the people around me and to try to just give that back to the people around me and back to myself to take the love that I had put so narrowly and exclusively into books and into ideas and into my career and to say, this is killing me. This is killing me. As good as these things are, as good as it is to be a good grad student at Yale, as good as it is to try to be a good scholar who does all the right things, it wasn't helping me. It was hurting me and I wasn't getting what I wanted out of it anyway. I would do the work and do the work and no one cared. Uh, no one cared because I didn't, I didn't realize I wasn't the right type of person. Um, if you think that your career is ultimately about merit, then you feel like anything that doesn't happen the way you want in your career is your fault. It's not. Sometimes we make mistakes, but a lot of times you know, just like I do, that you're great at what you do, but for some reason it doesn't seem to matter. That's how a lot of careers are. Um, careers are a very brutal thing that kind of destroy our humanity because we try to get our identity from a process that isn't about goodness and truth. It might be about sort of economic incentives and a lot of valuable things, but a career is never going to give you the life that you want. You have to find that life for yourself. And I found that philosophy in the deepest sense, not a philosophy that excludes everyone from Tony Robbins to Plato to the most brilliant scholar, they're all part of the same philosophical tradition. Buddhism is part of the same tradition. Hinduism, Native American philosophy, indigenous cultures in general, they are an essential part of my vision of what philosophy is. And it's not a vision I'm making up, it's the opposite. My scholarship, my rigorous scholarship in history, philosophy, and the study of science led me to that vision. But I didn't see that if I couldn't make that vision personal, I would myself sort of not be able to share it. I was literally unable to do anything. I couldn't move without what I would call a huge pain tax. So over the past few years, I continued to do my core work. I've built Marginalia Review of Books and it's incorporating now as a nonprofit. And we're doing major work on science and integrating science in public culture and bringing the value of the best of the academy to everyone. And we do that for free. If you wanna check out that work, check it out at www.themarginaliareview.com and support us. It's really exciting work. And I love that I'm doing it and have the privilege to do it. Beyond that work, the root of that work is my philosophical mission. And part of that is for you, for anyone who's interested. It's I want to make a certain amount of what I do available to the public. I want people to see that philosophy can change your life, that a good book and a great idea are some of the most exciting and just delightful things. Even if you don't care about sort of healing or anything like that, it's just a great way to spend your time to learn how to commune with the great figures of the past and of the present and to learn how to see that differences in culture and perspective are actually assets. And so I've I've built through the grace of the things that have happened to me and the grace of the powers that have been in my life, I've built or grown a philosophical vision that sees philosophy as essentially about life, that philosophy is for life. Philosophy is actually something that can and must heal us. It heals the divisions in our minds by starting with acknowledging them. And it can even heal divisions in our bodies through sort of the proper integrative use of all of the resources we have through science and through wisdom. So I think ultimately what philosophy is about is about the wisdom and integration that it can bring to heal our lives individually, culturally, and globally. And so my work has this sort of public nonprofit aspect through the Marginalia Review of Books, where I write, but mainly I work as an editor and I try to serve the system of academic and scientific scholarship as a whole to show people the relevance of that, to show other scholars how people in different fields might help them. I do interviews, write, I do writing, but mainly I sort of steer the ship with a strategic vision about where our culture is going in the digital age. What role do serious ideas and books have when hardly anyone reads anymore, right? It's also why I'm here on YouTube. I wanna bring this to everyone who's interested. And I'm now building out on my website at www.samuelankar.com, the first stage of the Becoming Human project as an actual system of education, not just online, but you can buy courses. So I have a crash course intro to philosophy. It's just three lectures. It doesn't assume any background whatsoever, but if you've liked what I've done on YouTube, you'll definitely like those. And you can check that out. I would encourage you to check it out. And I'll, I'll be releasing a course on Martin Heidegger. If you like the Heidegger series, there'll be a long course that goes into depth on his major book, Zeiner and Zeit, people call it being in time. I think it's existence in time. 
and I'll be creating a lot more content. And that's just the tip of the iceberg to eventually have a whole project that brings together the greatest teachers, not just scholars, because real teaching is the essence of scholarship, as I'll explain in other contexts. It brings the greatest teachers and scholars in the world to all of you. That's what I'm working on. And so if you're excited about that, please check out my courses, buy them at my website, go to Patreon, support me there, you know, just to get certain updates, sign up for my newsletter, which you can find at my website and subscribe to the Marginalia Review of Books. And I wanna tell you, any of you out there, particularly those of you who may be physically suffering right now and who might feel hopeless, I want to tell you that hope is always a true idea. Hope is always valid. No matter how you feel, there is a reason to hope. And love is part of that reason. And if you don't feel that right now, I want to say I'm sorry. And if I were there, I would tell you, I have hope for you and I believe in your life. And, and we need to hear that. We need to hear that someone believes in us. And I believe every human being is destined to live a great life and that we can live that life if we pursue it. And I'm not saying it will lead to health and all these things and wealth, but I think it will lead to health. It does lead to healing. And health is the foundation of all true wealth. If you have your body and you have a solid meaning and purpose in your life, then in the deepest sense, you're going to become wealthy, whatever that means. It's not about money. It's about a kind of gift that you're able to share with your community. And so part of the wealth that I have isn't economic in the traditional sense, although I have ideas that are very valuable. It's teaching. It's the ability to share with all of you. That's part of what I want to give you. And by giving that to you, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for those of you who've subscribed to my channel and have been watching and supporting me. I want to thank you for those of you who are already supporting on Patreon or already buying my courses, like the Introduction to Philosophy or my course on Choice and Freedom, which is a very practical course showing how deep ideas about freedom and choice help us live better every day. And I want to thank all of you who've supported that and just all of you who are doing great stuff on YouTube. I see you as part of the history of education. I see you as part of the future of education and philosophy. And I've learned from so many of you and I hope I can form relationships and share more about channels that I really like and just create partnerships of all kinds. So I just want to thank all of you. I want to wish you a wonderful new year and I want to thank you for coming on this little journey with me. And I'm excited for what I'm going to release this year. And I hope that you're excited too. Please do like the video, subscribe to my channel, and check out my work because it's really our work, work that we can all do together. And I'm so glad you're part of it. Thank you very much. My name is Samuel Ankar. I'm a philosopher. I'm the editor of the Marginalia Review of Books. And I'm the creator and founder of the Becoming Human Project, which is a project for all of us who are humans, who realize we're not yet what we want to be, but we want to find more of what it means to be human and find our life in that process. That's what philosophy is. Thanks so much for joining me.